So welcome everybody to Ansible 101 for the Windows Sysadmin. Uh, I'm Josh King. I don't have an About Me slide today because, like I said, I am up against time. So just really quickly, if you do want to reach out to me, I'm available on Blue Sky and uh, Mastodon. Um, and those will be, I'll have those again at the end. Uh, I'm a infrastructure ops engineer at Chocolatey. Um, and a lot of my day job now is Ansible. So um, I've been enjoying it. Um, before we crack in though, um, do take a minute to thank, uh, well, I do want to take a minute to thank our sponsors because um, without them, the um, this event doesn't happen. Uh, so make the most of them being out there. Yes, I did start slightly early. <laughs> um, Make the most of them being out there, have a chat with them, grab some swag, although it's getting towards the end, so it might be a bit slim pickings out there by now. Um, so what is this talk? Well, last year I did a 90-minute session on adding Ansible to your Windows infrastructure toolkit. Um, and in that talk, we uh, spun up some VMs. If I remember correctly, we did that in Azure. Um, we configured them, applied a hard... Uh, hardening baseline to them, and installed some software with Chocolatey. But that talk assumed um, you already at least had Ansible running and had a sort of a baseline of knowledge there, and some of the feedback I got on that was, well, how do I get to that point? Um, so the point of this talk is effectively to take um, what I'm assuming to be a almost exclusively Windows um, sysadmin, and getting, to, getting them to the point where they can just go into that next, uh, last year's video and follow through with the demos there. Um, that is going to require a little bit of Linux and of course Ansible. So to start with what is Ansible, and this slide is ripped directory, directly from last year because as much as I tried, I couldn't find a better way of explaining it. Um, so there's the concept of infra infrastructure as code, which of course is codifying your infrastructure so that you can potentially um, redeploy it or um, basically reproduce that, um, that infrastructure. Now that concept, infrastructure as code, can be broadly split into two sections. You've got infrastructure provisioning, which is sort of like your hardware, even if it's virtual. So those could be spinning up virtual machines, creating virtual networks, um, deploying uh, deploying firewalls, app gateways, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's configuration management, which is actually configuring that infrastructure. So that could be creating firewall rules, it could be deploying software, um, anything like that. On the infrastructure provisioning side, you've got tools like Terraform, Pulumi, um, AWS CloudFormation, of course, um, you've got ARM templates and Bicep now. Um, and on the configuration management side, you've got tools like Chef, Puppet, SaltStack. And Ansible sort of straddles the middle. It's a, um, it's a set of tools that um, enable all of infrastructure as code. And it does an okay job at infrastructure provisioning. It does an okay job at configuration management. Maybe not as good as those dedicated tools, but it does a good enough job that I've, um, so far, been able to um, dedicate to learning one tool and um, covering the whole spectrum of infrastructure as code. Um, so it's really allowed me to dive deep into Ansible rather than having to spread my learning across a couple of tools. Um, before we get into it, um, well, before we get into the demo, um, some important concepts. Ansible runs on a Linux host, which is why we need to have a little bit of Linux in our back pocket because um, we are gonna be touching that. Um, and to achieve that uh, requirement, you could use Windows Subsystem for Linux on a Windows box or run a full VM or run bare metal Linux. Um, I personally go for a full uh, Linux VM, um, but that's just because I use VMware Workstation and turning on the WSL stuff kills some of the things I need out of works, uh, VMware. So um, I sort of don't have a choice. Um, your configuration code is going to be written in YAML, um, your playbooks and the like. Um, so you're going to be dealing with um, a lot of indents. 
indents are going to um, become very important to you as you dive into YAML. Um, and generally speaking, uh, commands are executed on the target host. So say you've told Ansible, I want to create a directory. Um, it goes and connects to that machine, creates the directory, um, and effectively in the Windows world, it'll be running PowerShell on that host to do the... Um, to create the directory. And of course, there's exceptions to every rule. Um, say, for example, you are um, provisioning infrastructure in AWS or Azure or whatever, there's nothing there yet to connect to. Um, so um, your local host itself um, generally will um, connect to those services with the APIs and um, issue the commands needed to spin up that infrastructure. And there are ways in Ansible to delegate where commands are run. So you could say, hang on, no, I want this command to run locally, or I want it to run on this other host, even though it's not the one I'm ex um, uh, currently configuring. And Ansible's Linux first, and we're going to see that in a bit. But um, that does mean if you're Googling for help, be very specific that you're looking for Windows Ansible help, because otherwise you're going to end up down a, a rabbit hole that potentially doesn't apply to you. Um, so this talk is about um, Ansible for the Windows sysadmin and specifically um, managing Windows. So um, I use Windows, by the way. Um, Ansible requires a WinRM connection between your Ansible server or that Linux VM and the target that you're managing, the Windows target that you're managing. SSH is possible, but it's still marked as an, ex an experimental feature, and I haven't used it yet, so I can't vouch for it. WinRM's just worked for me, so um, I haven't bothered to um, put too much time into investigating SSH. Uh, there are lots of author, uh, auth options. Um, today we're going to be using NTLM in the demo. There is also Kerberos. There's basic auth, there's certificate, if I remember correctly. Um, and of course, those are all listed in the docs. Um, and like I said, Ansible's Linux first, which means um, they had to distinguish the Windows commands. So by convention, the commands in Ansible that target Linux are prefixed with win underscore. Um, so for example, there's a command called copy, which you use on Linux hosts. If you want to do the same thing on Windows, you use win underscore copy. Um, I've got my own little uh, protest against that um, in my own Ansible uh, code, but I won't go down that rabbit hole here. Um, so let's demo. Um, I th believe I promised in the um, abstract for this that we're basically going to go from nothing to um, running Ansible. So this, I'm connected to a uh, newly installed um, Linux box. Doesn't have, uh, sorry, doesn't have Ansible installed. Um, and we're gonna get it installed, set up, and um, managing a Windows box. So Ansible needs Python, and the current version of Ansible requires Python 3.10 through 3.12. Um, this, uh, operating system, I'm running Rocky Linux here. It doesn't, well, actually, let's just have a look. The version of Python running on, on it's 3.9. And if you were to just try and update Python, it would just try and update to the latest version of 3.9. If I want a newer version of Python, I have to specifically go and get that specific version. Um, and at the moment, or at least when I was writing this demo, I couldn't go all the way up to 3.11 without like compiling it myself or grabbing it from somewhere other than the official repo. So I'm going to go and install uh, Python 3. Sorry, I'm not sure which Python version I said. I'm going to install 3.11. 3.12 is not available yet. Um, so using my systems um, package manager, DNF, I'll go and install the Python version that they need. Um, so I'm specifically calling out, I need 3.11. And the only reason I know 3.12 is not available is because when I tried to ask for it, it said it can't be found. <laughs> so, uh, and Python's one of those um, tools that 
you can have multiple versions installed and they'll happily live side by side and um, as we'll see here in a sec actually. So if I look at the Python version now that that's been installed, hey it's still 3.9, that's not what we want. And if we look specifically at Python 3, still 3.9. Um, now we could change where these, these are effectively aliases pointing at a version of Python. We could change these um, to point to 3.11 and then everything that called PowerShell would then use that version, but that could potentially break things. So instead I'm going to specifically call 3.11. Um, if I do double dash. Um, so I'm spe specifically going to call the 3.11 um, executable. Um, now, there's multiple ways to install Ansible. You can install it from your systems um, via your systems package manager like Python there, except um, it's generally going to be an older version of um, Ansible. And if you're using a um, Linux distro like this one, it's going to be very old. Um, so regardless of the distribution for Linux, I, I prefer installing it via um, the Python package manager pip. Um, that it ensures I always get the latest version um, available. The problem is I don't have pip installed. So we'll go and grab that really quick. And luckily, um, the command is very similar to before. I'm just basically grabbing the pip module for Python, uh, specifically the 3.11 version of pip. And that's done. Um, so now I can install um, Ansible. And I do that um, now that I've got pip installed by using the pip module of Python. Um, and I say install Ansible, and I'm going to install this to my user scope, because um, I do. <laughs> so this should be nice and quick. Um, just while it is going, I'll point out, so it is installing Ansible, then there's also Ansible core, which is the core sort of functionality of Ansible itself. Um, there is Jinja 2, which is the templating engine, which in my opinion is where the real power of Ansible comes from, is that. Um, and I wish I had more time to dive into, um, I believe I said the same thing last year, I wish I had more time to dive into Jinja, um, but there's other things to look at. Um, so we've got Ansible installed now, and we can test that it's working by running Ansible itself. And similar to Python, we're going to call a, mo a user module called ping. And uh, we'll do it against localhost. And when we do this, it says um, there is a warning up there that says no inventory was passed, so I can only target localhost at the moment. Um, but it did report back the success, and I got a pong on my ping. Um, now, this isn't like an echo request. It's not just saying, hey, this thing's on the network. It has actually connected to, um, in this case, localhost, um, and verified that um, the connection for Ansible is up. Um, now, I used the word module there, um, and there's dash, where the command says dash m ping. In Ansible, you can roughly think of modules. Um, I'll use, probably be using the word command from here on out. Um, but modules, you can think of them roughly like functions or commandlets in PowerShell. Um, they are the things that you call to um, execute a task. Um, so there's a file command you would use in PowerShell, say, new item. Um, they're sort of roughly equivalent. Uh, and then these modules are then effectively shipped within collections, and not to confuse things, collections in Ansible are like modules in PowerShell. <laughs> These are the things that contain multiple commands and you use those to ship those to other people and share them and consume them. Um, and there's a bunch of these collections that have been installed by default. Uh, collections, 
list. Um, that command that I run, ansible-galaxy, is the command you use to manage collections. Um, you can install new ones via that. Um, and the name of it comes from the, well, I'm not sure which came first, but there's a, a repository online called Ansible Galaxy, which is effectively like the PowerShell gallery. That's where collections are hosted and you can um, consume them from there. Um, but this is quite an extensive list of collections that have um, been installed by default. So we can see there's some AWS stuff in here, there's Azure, uh, there's of course some Windows commands. Uh, Chocolatey does maintain a collection as well and that's installed by default. Um, there's a whole host of community stuff in here, um, including a community Windows um, collection. Um, and yeah, the list goes on, there's Google Cloud in there, all sorts. Um, I was planning on having a second screen, but I didn't bring it, so I'm working out of a notebook. Um, so we've got Ansible installed now, effectively. Um, our Ansible box, um, yeah, it's installed. It can technically connect to things, but our Windows box isn't ready to be connected to. So um, the first thing I need is a user. So let's go ahead and create a new local user. Now, there. Um, I'm calling this user Ansible. Um, you can name it literally anything. It, um, I'm just calling it Ansible because I'm not feeling very creative at the moment with my naming. And you'll see that when you see the name of this Windows box as well. Um, uh, password. Never expires. There we go. Give it a password. All right, created our user. Now this user is what Ansible is going to connect to this box as. So it's going to need whatever permissions um, are needed to carry out the task that you want Ansible to carry out on that machine. If you're installing software, that probably means it's going to need some sort of um, administrator type credential. Um, for my demo here, I'm going to be just adding it to the local admins group. Um, you may want to create your uh, properly scoped group in production that this goes specifically into and has just the permissions it needs. Um, so do what I say and not what I do, I guess. Uh, uh, so I'm adding it to the uh, local administrators group. It's always one of those words that I can't uh, type on demand. Well, it didn't complain, so I must have typed it right. So that account's ready to go now, effectively. I've, um, but I still need to prep this machine for having a remote connection. Um, now, Ansible does supply a script to set this all up, and that's what I'm going to use today. Um, in theory, you can get away with just doing... Um, WinRM quick config should get you most of the way there for a lab environment where you don't need um, certificates or SSH or anything. Um, what their script does is, oops, quite a big one, all things considered. Um, let's blow that up just a little bit. There we go. Um, so it has a bunch of comments right up the top. One of the most important ones is the script is going to generate a self-signed cert. Um, and like it says there, that's intended for development environments. In production, you would want to use a CA signed cert. Um, and there's also a bunch of other options in here that you may want to consider for your, um, if you're setting things up in production. For my demo environment, though, I'm just going to run it. Um, so this script is, like I said, in the documentation for setting up a Windows host from Ansible. Um, and there's a link to that and some resources that I've got at the end of the um, slide deck. Um, so now we're ready to connect. Uh, if I now go back to... Oh, actually, I did say you'll see what the name of this um, box is. 
I was very creative this time around. Um, right, so we saw before that warning saying that there's no inventory available. So, so first thing we're going to need to do is basically tell Ansible about the host that it's going to be, uh, don't we? Uh, that it's going to be managing. So I've created a folder for my demos. Um, ignore playbooks there. I, as I said, I was up against time, so I've pre-populated that instead of making you watch me type for a couple of minutes. Um, because stuff like that happens. Um, so I've created a folder called inventory, and in there, uh, that's just a convention, the folder could be named anything, um, and I'm going to make a host file in there. Now, this, um, this inventory can take the form of an any or config file, um, or a YAML file, and because basically everything else is going to be YAML, I stick with YAML for my um, inventory as well. Now in this file you list groups and then you assign host to those groups as well. Um, your hosts are always going to be a member of two groups. The uh, automatically assigned to a group called all, so that's literally just how you can um, address all of the um, all of the machines in your estate or at least the ones in your inventory. And then they're also a member of either the groups you've defined or if you've listed them in here without assigning them to a group, they go into an ungrouped group. Um, I'm pretty sure the name of it's ungrouped. I've never actually used it because of how I um, fill this out. I literally can't have an, a host that's ungrouped. Um, so my first group, um, just because I want to list everything that's in my lab here, I'm going to call Linux servers. And that has two hosts. Uh, there is Ansible, and there is Nexus. Um, Nexus is just a box that I've got here, um, basically shielding me from any Wi-Fi issues. So it's already pre-cached all of those things I've been installing, so I don't have to um, stress about the Wi-Fi going down. Um, then my second group is, of course, Windows servers. Um, now, groups can have child groups in there. Um, and yeah, groups can have child groups. Um, hosts can belong to multiple groups. Um, so like I've got Windows and Linux here. Um, you could have say AWS hosted, Azure hosted, on-prem, um, whatever, to, however you need to group your um, things together. Um, and then you can um, target your uh, commands appropriately. So, now that we have an inventory defined, if I've typed everything correctly, I should be able to go back here and say, actually, yeah, make things easier on myself, let's go into that directory. Uh, I should be able to say, go and target all of my Linux servers. Uh, inventory, so the dash i is me telling Ansible where that inventory that I've created is. And it needs to know specifically that that file that contains the um, uh, the list of groups and hosts. And what we'll see here is two things. It's successfully connected to Nexus. We can see that down the bottom here. Um, it did ask me first to accept the key from that server because I haven't connected um, via SSH from Ansible to my Nexus box yet. Um, but it did now fail to connect to itself, and that's because it's trying to use SSH, and because of how I've set up my lab, it couldn't resolve its own name, and I don't think it could even get a SSH session up to itself. So we need to tell Ansible how to connect to Ansible now. Um, now we can add variables into this uh, file, but as you can imagine, if you've got a huge inventory, um, adding variables to the mix here can make things quite uh, uh, busy. So instead what we can do is we can create two folders, uh, host files and group files. 
Now, in these directories, if you create in group vars a file with the .yaml extension that has the name that matches a group, it will apply whatever variables are in that file to hosts under that group. Um, and same with um, hosts, if it matches the name of a host, it'll apply those variables to that host. Um, and the order of precedence there is, say you've assigned some variables to the all group, um, those can be overridden by a more specific group. group. And then um, if you specify host variables, um, those will override it as well. Um, and then there's a couple of other ways of overriding further down the chain, but we're not quite there yet. Um, so in this case, I need to tell Ansible how to connect to my Ansible host. And this is um, Ansible connection. So there's a bunch of um, a bunch of variables that tell Ansible how to do its thing. Um, and they all start with Ansible underscore. This one tells Ansible how, how to connect to the machine. And um, I'm telling it this is a local connection. So now, if I go back here and run that, um, now it can connect, because it's not trying to SSH into itself now, it's just doing it locally. Um, but we're here about man uh, to learn about managing Windows. So let's look at uh, pinging our Windows servers. Now you notice this is taking a while to come back. What it's doing is it's trying to connect via SSH to that box. And it should come back in a moment saying, no, I can't get an SSH connection up. So same thing, we need to tell it, no, actually this is a Windows box, we want you to connect with WinRM. Now this is going to be something that applies to all of our Windows servers. So instead of doing it specifically for that host, we will do a group vars file for all of our Windows servers, if I can type it right. .yaml. Uh, Ansible connection to start. Uh, so of course we're connecting via um, WinRM. And because this is a lab environment, uh, WinRM server, sorry, this is a long one, validation. Um, it does have the self-signed cert there, and I don't want that to cause issues, so I'm going to tell it to ignore any cert validation stuff. Um, of course, in prod, if you're using CA cert, you wouldn't want to do that, obviously. Um, but we do it here. Uh, then Ansible WinRM transport. So this is where we tell it what auth mechanism we're using. And of course I mentioned we're using NTLM. If you're in a domain environment, you'd probably use uh, Kubros instead. Um, and then Ansible WinRM uh, scheme, HTTP, and Ansible port. Uh, no. 5.985. So 5.985 is the well-known um, HTTP port for WinRM. If you left out this line and were using this port, Ansible would be able to infer that you wanted to use HTTP. And if you change that to 5.986, which is the HTTPS port, it would infer that you wanted HTTPS. The reason why I do the belts and braces thing here of specifying the scheme is because if you're behind a NAT and you change the port, suddenly Ansible doesn't know what scheme to use and um, it throws some very cryptic error messages at you. Um, and the fix for that is on my boss's blog and I keep finding myself there. So I put it in here and I never have to think about it again. And I can override the stuff in a host, var, a host file if I need to. So now let's go back and try and ping a Windows server again. No. So, Ansible now knows it needs to use WinRM. It's gone to Python and said, please use WinRM, and Python's gone, I don't know. Um, so we need to, um, base, even though Ansible's been installed with all of those collections and stuff that allow management of Windows boxes, um, the same isn't true of Python. So we actually need to install a Python module um, that allows that. <laughs> 
So we are going to install PyWinRM, which is the Python module that supports WinRM. There we go. Now, we connect, but of course, we need a username. So, let's go and add that for specifically our Windows box. Uh, and that variable is Ansible user. And if you remember, we just called it Ansible. Right, but of course, we've got a username, now we're gonna need a password. Rather than putting that in the file and potentially saving it as clear text, I'm going to tell Ansible, actually, ask me for the password. And remember I said Linux first? It's assuming the password I'm asking for is SSH. Um, so ignore that prompt and give it um, the password anyway. Now, this is where um, we circle back to what I said in the, um, in the slides, with Ansible being Linux first. We're using the ping command. That doesn't work on Windows. So what we've got here is output from Python saying, hey, I tried to run this thing, and um, it didn't make any sense. So, um, well, actually, that's still back in my console. So instead of ping, we want win ping. And all going well, we get our Pong response back. So now our connection is up um, between Ansible and our Windows box. Um, I did sort of draw that out a bit because I wanted to go through the process of, you know, iterating through that. Um, of course, if you, if you go and redo this at home or at work, you can just skip straight to the point and put all that stuff in your inventory and, you know, you're done. Um, the key thing is, if you're installing Ansible, just remember to install that uh, Python package. Oh, I am well ahead of myself in my notes. So I did want to cover um, Ansible, the Ansible config file, but uh, it got axed because I needed some extra time. So we're going to skip ahead um, and start looking at playbooks. Um, so, so far we've been running ad hoc commands on the command line, just calling Ansible saying, run this module against this server. All right. Now we want um, to go into the playbooks that I said to ignore for now. Um, so a playbook is basically like, think of it like a script file in PowerShell. You specify the commands you want to run, it's going to run through them. Um, you can do things as you get it more into this of um, looping. You can do conditional statements to say, only run this task if this other thing's true. You can capture the output from things. You can do all sorts in here. Um, of course, we're starting um, simple for today. Um, so the first thing in a playbook, um, you can give the entire play a name, but I... I don't know why I don't, but I just tend to skip that. Um, so the first thing I do is specify which hosts this playbook is targeting. So of course, in this case, that's my Windows servers. And what I want to do is create a directory um, on potentially all of my Windows servers, but this lab environment just has the one, um, on the C drive called tools. And that's using this win file command or module. Um, and the way I've done it here is sort of like the fully qualified way of addressing a module or a command in Ansible. So this Ansible.windows is the collection that that module is coming from. Um, and you'll see um, the one, the command below, it's also coming from that module. Um, you could just specify the um, module and it should figure out what you're wanting to run. Um, I've run into situations where I've actually had multiple things providing the same module, but they're coming from different collections. So I've just gotten into the habit of um, being verbose when I'm doing my um, playbooks. Um, and then just a note on the state thing. In Ansible, the state is, general, is normally absent or present. Um, of course, present means make this thing appear there or be in this way, and absent means potentially delete it or undo whatever you did to put it there. 
um, because Windfall does multiple things, um, you have to tell it that you want to create a directory, otherwise you're going to get a tools file sitting there on disk, which doesn't really help us. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to use the win copy command to copy a file into that directory. And by not specifying a file name on the destination, we're saying keep the original file name. Uh, now that file is, I've just uh, pointed to it relative to where this uh, demo file sits, so it's under files. And in here, um, these curly braces are um, basically saying that I want um, the variable name so in this case company name, to be substituted for that entire thing starting and ending at the final curly brace. Um, so let's define those variables because they aren't defined anywhere yet. Uh, so we've got company name and machine type. Uh, and these can apply to everything in our estate. Uh, we have company name, and we'll go with example Inc. And we had machine type, if I remember correctly. And we're just going to say virtual machine. Okay, but maybe I don't want my Windows box to say virtual machine. I want it to say type. So what we'll do in the host vars is say, well, actually, this is a Windows Server 2019 box. All right, where's our demo? Um, and just to show that there's no smoke and mirrors, um, if we look on the C drive of this VM, there's currently no tools directory. <coughs> All right. So let's run this playbook. Um, so we're going to move away from using the Ansible um, executable, and we now use the Ans not that Ansible playbook um, command, and we are going to point at our playbook demo one. Um, and so, because I've specified which hosts we're targeting in the playbook, of course, don't need to tell it here, but we do need to tell it. Uh, where the inventory is, uh, and also to ask for the password. That's the bit that um, the configuration, if we got to that, was going to stop us having to do, um, just as a spoiler. <laughs> right, so the first thing it does, unless you tell it not to, is gather facts, as you can see there. It's just going off and getting a bunch of system information about the host, which you can use in later steps. Um, and the output there, you can see... Um, OK or green means I've done the thing, I didn't change anything. Um, in this scheme, it's sort of a brown, but orange means I've changed something. Something on the system has been changed because of this command. If I run it again, um, because it's already been run, we've already created that directory, directory, we already copied that file, everything comes back green because nothing needed to change. And if we look, we've now got our tools folder. We've got our example text file, but those variables weren't substituted in. So the reason was this copy command just takes the file as is and dumps it on disk. It doesn't care about the content, it just dumps it on disk. What we want instead is the win template command, and this is where the ginger templating stuff comes in. So this command will evaluate those ginger template syntax things, and that could be loops, it could be, be conditionals, you can literally generate this file from um, the Jinja syntax. Um, of course, we're keeping it simple here and just um, substituting those variables. Um, but it evaluates it and then dumps it on disk. So what we should see here is we don't need to create the directory, but we do need to change that file. There we go. And if we look at the VM again, we can see that the variables have now been substituted in. And our one that was specific to this host, the Windows Server 2019 variable, overrode the one that was in the org, uh, 
sorry, the all group. Um, so it is possible. I mentioned there was more precedence for those variables. You can specify in your playbooks variables um, that apply to this um, playbook itself. Those will override anything in the host files or the group files. And then also when you're running it from the command line, you can pass in extra variables with a dash E and those will override everything. Those take the highest precedence. Um, and I promised a little bit of PowerShell, so very quickly I'm gonna do that. Um, as good as all those commands are that are available, eventually you're gonna find a hole that there's not an Ansible module to do the thing you want to do. And luckily there is a um, PowerShell module available, which just allows you to run PowerShell. At that point you can do whatever you want, right? What this module gives you is a automatic variable called Ansible, which allows you to report back to Ansible things like whether or not the script that you ran changed something, uh, whether or not it failed, why it failed, um, and you can even pass back uh, data. So I mentioned you can capture um, information from a task. You can basically push out the results via this Ansible thing, and that's what um, would be captured if you were to capture the, the results. This specific example here, um, it checks to see if the NuGet a, uh, package provider is installed. If it's not, it'll install it and tell Ansible things have changed. Um, and if it's not, it doesn't do anything and says, no, I haven't changed. Uh, by default, um, by default, if you don't do any of that uh, ansible.change stuff, um, Ansible will always report back that a change happened. Of course, it's running a script that doesn't know whether or not something's changed. So what we should see here, this is a brand new Windows VM, so it does need to have um, the provider installed. So we can see changed. And if we run it again, we see, um, well, all going well, we see nothing had to be changed the second time. There we go. Because, of course, we're um, evaluating this if statement because it was false. Um, we didn't have to tell. Um, sorry, we didn't have to change everything and we told Ansible as such. So, um, that... Is that for the demo? Unfortunately, a little bit truncated, but I'll include the full, um, the bit that I had to cut, I'll include that in um, on the GitHub repo when I push all this through to um, the PowerShell, well, to the conference repo. Um, so, where to from here? The main thing I want to encourage is just have a go. Um, don't, let the fact that you need to um, use Linux, um, don't let that be a barrier to um, having a go with Ansible. Um, forgot where else I was going to go with that, but yeah, have a go. Um, you'll learn to love YAML, and um, no, you won't. <laughs> You're, I've uh, had troubleshooting sessions that have been multiple hours that have come down to a bad indent. Um, so get yourself a indent highlighter in VS Code and um, it'll help. Um, I've also been using Ansible as an excuse to learn Linux more and I've been really enjoying that. So um, yeah. Um, I do have a bunch of resources listed at that address, toast.click slash Ansible. Um, I've listed a bunch of docs, a bunch of suggested reading. Um, I will also say, if you didn't see it prior to this, um, when the videos go up online, have a look for Stephen Judd's talk on um, using Linux with PowerShell, because um, that's a, a, a great resource for getting stuck in to Linux as a Windows first um, admin. So we have, well, my clock was slow when we started, so I'm not sure if we actually have a couple of minutes for questions, but are there any questions? Yep. So the question was, what about automating those um, playbooks and that sort of thing? So I did um, include that at the end of the next talk, but um, 
where to from when you actually start to um, use this in an organization, you'd be looking at tools like AWX, um, which is the open source version of Ansible Tower, which now became Ansible Automation Platform. Or there's a um, community tool called Ansible Semaphore, um, which basically is a, uh, they're all basically platforms where you can, um, well, I'll talk about AWX specifically, um, you can pull into that your inventory, you can pull into that your playbooks, and then you can schedule and run them from there. And then you've got a central view of what things are running, what things are failing. Um, you end up using things like execution environments, which are containers that the, these jobs run in. Um, so there's quite a deep world once you start going into it. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. So the question was, does that PowerShell have to be in line? So it doesn't, but I've always done it in line. And that's just because my, my, how I've worked with it so far is if my PowerShell's gotten too long, I probably should break it up into multiple tasks. But that's just a how I work thing. Um, so I haven't actually gone and... Um, done the um, referencing a file thing. Um, one thing that you might have to do is, because the command's running on the remote machine, you may need to copy the PowerShell script first and then execute it on the machine rather than, um, yeah. So I'm not 100% sure, but it is possible. All right, I think we're on time now. Um, so if there's any further questions, come find me afterwards. Um, if you can't find me around, do get in touch online and please review the session.